It's pretty well known at this point that Zeus was now what you would call a great guy. Hey, let me explain. Personally, I'm a pretty big fan of Zeus. Please don't strike my house. Please don't strike my house. He's not perfect, but when you think about it, the man has a lot on his plate. Please don't strike my house. Please don't strike my house. As the king of Olympus, it's his responsibility to maintain order across the entire cosmos. That means keeping the scales of power balanced between the gods, ensuring that us mere mortals are happy, but not too happy, and of course, wiping us all out with fires and floods when we inevitably get too big for our britches and try to make ourselves the new gods. As the saying goes, it's lonely at the top. Being the king does have its perks, but it comes with more responsibility than most anyone could handle, which is why it's kind of surprising that Zeus fought so hard to not only take the throne, but keep it. Because after Zeus and the Olympians defeated the older generation of gods, known as Titans, and imprisoned them in the lowest reaches of the underworld, there was no taking it easy. In fact, there are some myths where he comes very close to losing his crown to his fellow gods, bloodthirsty monsters, and you might not believe this, even some mere mortals. That's why today we're diving into three myths where the king of the cosmos almost lost his right to rule. And it's not an exaggeration to say that myth number three might be the most ridiculous we've ever covered on this show. Seriously, I don't want to spoil it or overhype it, but this might just change the way you imagine ancient Greek society and the gods forever. Make sure to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons if you want more messed up myths and folklore sent to your sub box every single weekday. And without further ado, You kind of cut me off at the end there, but it's fine. I'm fine. Now, whether you're a newcomer to the world of Greek mythology or you're a dedicated follower of the old gods, you are no doubt aware of Zeus's nigh insatiable libido. It's almost impossible to get through a single myth without tripping over it. While his loftily wedded wife Hera was equally aware of his rapscallion tendencies, and it probably won't surprise you to learn that she harbored some resentment over it. I mean, not only was her husband violating her domains of marriage and family every chance he got, but you have to remember that as a goddess, she was prone to taking disrespect in the most personal way possible. That being said, Hera also learned from her husband's tricks, so instead of flipping out every time she caught him in the act, she bided her time and waited to strike until the moment was right. Meanwhile, she would just harass or even torture his babies and baby mamas to blow off some steam. But there's a little more to the story than that, and if you've ever wondered why Hera always takes out her frustrations on the innocent women who Zeus deceived, this story has your answer. The only known references to this event are found in two written works, Homer's Iliad and the Roman writer Valerius Flaccus's Argonautica not to be confused with Apollonius Rhodius's Argonautica that was written four centuries earlier. After reading both passages, we learn that Hera once staged an uprising with her fellow Olympians and tried to remove Zeus from his throne by force. Here's how it went down. Only a short time had passed after the gods' war with the Titans, called the Titanomachy, and Zeus had already started to pick up on some hostile vibes from the rest of the gods who didn't like that he was in charge. Maybe they were jealous of his power, and maybe some of them thought they could do better. Either way, Hera also sensed these vibes and orchestrated a coup with these disenfranchised gods. Now, the only gods explicitly named in helping with this heist are Poseidon and Athena. But Homer also says there was only one goddess who stayed true to Zeus, while all the rest assisted Hera in getting his hands and feet in shackles. He also doesn't say how they managed to get the drop on him, but there are other Homeric myths that describe Hera recruiting Hypnos, the god of sleep, to render Zeus unconscious, so I'm assuming a similar strategy was used this time around. When Thetis, an ocean nymph who would go on to birth Achilles, caught word of this rebellion, she knew she had to do something. Thinking quick on her feet, she raced to the lowest levels of the underworld, known as Tartarus, and alerted one of the hundred-armed Hecatonchores named Briarios. You see, prior to the Titanomachy, the Hecatonchores, all three of them, were imprisoned in Tartarus by their father Uranus shortly after they were born, because Uranus found their power intimidating and their faces super ugly. Well, during the Titanomachy, Zeus freed the Hecatonchores because of a prophecy stating that they would be pivotal in helping the Olympians win the war. Note that this was more for his benefit than theirs, but he still accepted their IOUs and gave them the prestigious position of standing guard over their former captors after the Titans were locked up in Tartarus. So when Thetis raced down to Briarios and told him that Zeus was in trouble, Briarios raced to Olympus to help. 
and the mere sound of his footsteps approaching was frightening enough to make all of the Olympians abandon their posts. When Zeus woke up from his trance, he was enraged at his siblings and children for trying to steal what was rightfully his. Most of all, though, he was furious with Hera and thought up a punishment to ensure that she would never attempt something like this ever again. In the words of Valerius Flaccus, he hung up Juno, Hera, from the wheeling sky and showed to her chaos and its horror and the doom of the abyss. We aren't told what she saw in there, but one can certainly imagine. The abyss contained pain, suffering, infinite timelines that ended in the gods' bloodshed and wanton destruction of the cosmos. There were monsters with an insatiable hunger for power and constructs that even the goddess couldn't comprehend. Most importantly, she saw what would happen if she continued down this path of rebellion against her husband. So when he finally let her free from her chains, she agreed to never attack him directly ever again. At least that's one version of how her imprisonment goes down. Valerius Flaccus actually never mentions those terms and instead says she was freed by Hephaestus, the god of blacksmithing who couldn't watch his mom suffer any longer. In that timeline, Zeus found out about Hephaestus' involvement and in a rage threw him down from Mount Olympus. And while all those on Earth believed they saw a star falling from the sky, it was really Hephaestus' body, which landed hard on the island of Lemnos and resulted in him having a permanent limp. Naturally, there's another version of how Hephaestus got that limp, but if you want to hear that story, you'll have to watch my animated special called The Very Messed Up Tale of Hephaestus' Revenge. But with one rebellion squashed, we've got two more to go, and these are doozies. First though, I want to thank our fantastic sponsors whose support allowed me to pay for all the custom art that you're seeing in this episode, Squarespace. If you have a hobby or passion project that you're wanting to take to the next level, Squarespace is the first place you want to look. For for over a decade now, Squarespace has been empowering people like you and I, giving us the tools we need to build beautiful websites with ease, efficiency, and without breaking the bank. After choosing one of their dozens of award-winning website templates to get you started, you could set up a gallery of your artwork, sell your own products, or start collecting emails for your community newsletter. And while this all may sound complicated at first, Squarespace has an intuitive interface that lets you drag and drop elements, resize text, and a a lot more without having to know how to code. But if you still find yourself needing help, there's no need to stress. Their personalized customer support is available 24 seven, so you can get your issues resolved immediately. And have I mentioned this can all be done inside your web browser, because the fact that you don't have to download anything to use Squarespace is the cherry on top for me. So whether you wanna give your business a fresh new online identity or get professional with your passion, you can go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Zeus has battled and conquered many enemies during his time on the throne, but none were as terrifying as Typhon. But John, you said that the third myth was the craziest. How could Typhon be the most intimidating if we're only on the second? Well, you're just gonna have to wait and see. Aren't you, Derek? By the way, Shut Up Derek shirts are gonna be available in the new merch store we're launching. Stay tuned for updates in the coming weeks. Or sign up for our mailing list at meremortals.store. Link is in the description. Now, Zeus's battle with Typhon actually took place before the previous myth about Hera. Pretty much immediately after Zeus conquered the Titans and took hold of his scepter, his grandmother, Gaia, the personification of the Earth, got real pissy about the way her Titan children were treated. Considering that she'd already spawned one child who defeated and humiliated a godly king, she figured she could do it again and hooked up with Tartarus, the personification of the lowest regions of the underworld. From their union, Typhon was created, and this dude was a sight to behold. In the words of Hesiod, he was terrible, outrageous, and lawless. Strength was with his hands in all that he did, and the feet of the strong god were untiring. From his shoulders grew a hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon with dark, flickering tongues, and from under the brows of his eyes and his marvelous heads flashed fire, and fire burned from his heads as he glared. And there were voices in all of his dreadful heads, which uttered every kind of sound unspeakable. For at one time, they made sounds such that the gods understood, but at another, the noise of a bull bellowing aloud in proud, ungovernable fury. And at another, the sound of a lion, relentless of heart. 
and at another, sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear. And again, at another, he would hiss so that the high mountains re-echoed. In other words, he sounded like a pug snoring. Now, Typhon was a popular subject for the Greek poets and playwrights, so there's a number of different ways that his attack on Olympus goes down. But for the most part, they don't actually contradict each other, which is really convenient for me because I can just blend them all together. Those who want to look more into the variations, I'd recommend checking out the works of Hesiod, Pindar and Nicander, Pseudo Apollodorus, Oppian and Nanus. But if I had to recommend just one, I'd say check out Nanus's Dionysiaca, which gives us the most detailed description of their battle. So one day, while Zeus was in the process of seducing Pluto, the mother of Tantalus, not the other name for Hades, he'd hidden his thunderbolts in a cave somewhere, and the smoke that they generated allowed Gaia and Typhon to track them down and hide them somewhere else. With Zeus's signature weapon gone, Typhon was emboldened to extend his serpentine arms into the heavens and attack the gods directly, which the gods responded to by running away and hiding, just like they did with the Hecatonchores. Every Olympian except for Zeus and Athena fled to Egypt and disguised themselves as animals. Apollo turned into a hawk, Hermes became an ibis, Ares a fish, Artemis a cat, Dionysus a goat, Hephaestus an ox, Leto a mouse, and Pan became a goat fish, which would go on to become the Capricorn mascot. These animal forms were how the Greeks connected their gods to the Egyptian pantheon and how they explained the Egyptian practice of animal worship. Hermes the ibis was equated with Thoth, Apollo the hawk was Horus, etc. With Zeus essentially abandoned to defend his kingdom alone, I know Athena was there, but none of the poets actually mention her doing anything of importance, he had his work cut out for him. Not to mention, he didn't even have his weapon of choice. Instead, he was forced to wield the same adamantium sickle that his father Cronus used to castrate his father Uranus, which sounds pretty badass, but it didn't exactly work out for him. Typhon used his snake-like appendages to restrain Zeus, took the sickle out of his hands, and used it to carve out his sinews the tendons that connected his muscles to his bones. This left Zeus totally limp and unable to move. Meanwhile, Typhon threw his limp body to the side, wrapped his sinews in bear skin, and hid them in another cave that he charged Rakina, a dragon woman, to stand guard over. At this point, Zeus was finally able to get help from his fellow gods. Depending on the version you read, Hermes, Pan, or sometimes both of them, tracked down Zeus's sinews and thunderbolts and stole them back without anyone being the wiser. Soon after, Typhon's plans for world domination were interrupted by the sound of thunder, and when he looked up, he saw a revenge-driven Zeus flying through the stormy sky on his chariot, thunderbolts in hand. For the first time in his life, Typhon felt actual fear, and instead of taking Zeus head-on, he turned and ran. He ran all the way to the mountain of Nyssa where the fates were waiting for him, and they had a plan of their own. They presented Typhon with some grapes and said that eating them would grant him the strength that he needed to defeat Zeus. And for some reason, he believed them. In reality, the grapes weakened Typhon, I believe by intoxicating him. But you know drunk people, they have all the confidence in the world. So the moment the Typhon heard the thunder rolling in, he picked up a mountain and threw it directly at Zeus, only for Zeus to send the mountain flying back at Typhon which hurt him a lot. From Nyssa, Typhon fled to Thrace, threw some more mountains, then to Sicily, where he threw even more mountains. But Zeus just kept returning them to Sender. Then, when the king of the cosmos saw that his enemy was exhausted and vulnerable, he hit him with a devastating one-two combo. He struck Typhon with a lightning bolt, knocking him to the ground. Then he picked up Mount Etna and slammed it on Typhon's body burying him under countless tons of rock and magma. From that point onward, Typhon never caused a problem for the gods ever again, though he was known to cause the occasional disturbance for us mere mortals in the form of volcanic eruptions. And if you thought Typhon was a worthy adversary for the gods, just wait until you hear about Zeus's battle with the birds. Our third and final myth comes from a playwright named Aristophanes, who's known as the father of comedy and had a reputation for recreating life in ancient Athens more convincingly than any other author. If you've seen my episode on the gods of wealth and poverty, then you're already familiar with his work and sense of humor. 
but if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you check it out if you're a fan of this production. Now, just to be clear, this play is not considered canon Greek mythology, but it does give us a unique take on the way ancient Greeks perceive the gods as well as their relationship to them. People nowadays tend to think that the Greeks saw the gods as flawless beings and revered every facet of their existence, but in reality, it was acceptable to tease them and even make them look a little foolish on occasion. Which is funny, because every once in a while I get a comment saying that I'm disrespecting the gods with my jokes. Like this guy who thought I went too hard on Demeter when I joked about her keeping the Midwest too cold. Which is objectively true. I know it's petty to get hung up on comments like that, especially when they're coming from uninformed people, but it's still so satisfying whenever I get to say, you don't know what the f you're talking about, Derek. So this play opens on two disgruntled Athenians named Pistheteris, whose name means trusty friend, and Euolpides, whose name translates to good hope. Both of them loudly complain that they're fed up with life in Athens, where people spend all day arguing about the laws, and that they're looking for Tyrius, a king who is transformed into a hoopo, a kind of bird, in the hopes that they can find a better life elsewhere. Eventually, they find Tyrius and vent to him about their unfulfilled lives, when suddenly they get a brilliant idea. The bird should stop flying around all day like idiots, and instead build themselves a city in the sky, because that would allow them to lord over men, and blockade the sacrifices made to the gods. There's the blockade. Personally, I never imagined sacrifices as goods that could be intercepted, but that may be where the non-canon rules of the play come in. Well, Tyrius is a huge fan of this idea, but he tells the men that they'll have to convince all the other birds to make it happen. So, he summons them all to a meeting, and Pistheteris lays out a pretty compelling pitch that gets all the birds on board, with the caveat that the two Athenians lead their war against the Olympians, which they agree to. At the start of the next scene, the two Athenians enter the stage in some pretty unconvincing bird costumes and proclaim that they're naming their new sky city Nephilo Cochesia, which literally translates to Cloud Cuckoo Land. So that's fun. From this point onward, Pistheteris, the smarter of the Olympians, starts taking charge. He orders his friend to watch over the building of Cloud City's walls while he organizes a religious service to honor the birds as the new gods. Thanks to the collaborative effort of so many different birds, it didn't take long for the city walls to be constructed. But apparently, they didn't do a great job because one of the gods sneaks through them almost immediately. That god is Iris, the personification of the rainbow, and when the birds catch her, Piss the Terrace lays out some pretty devastating insults before telling her to fly back to Zeus and complain about it. Soon after this, crowds of men start flocking to the bird city, pun intended with the hopes of being welcomed, but Pistheteris sends all of them packing until Prometheus arrives. When the Titan enters, he's shading himself with an umbrella. You see, he's a known enemy of Zeus and says the umbrella helps him avoid being seen by the heavens. He tells the Athenians that the Olympians are ready to negotiate because they're starving, but he also warns them that they shouldn't agree to negotiate until Zeus agrees to give up his scepter and his girlfriend's sovereignty who's the real power in his household. The Athenians consider this warning, and moments later, some delegates from Olympus arrive. The ocean god Poseidon, Heracles, who's portrayed as a dumb brute, and Tribalus, an even dumber brute who's worshipped by barbarians. Their negotiations go on for a while, and even though you'd think that the odds were stacked against the mere mortals, Piss the Terrace was clever. He convinced Heracles that if the gods were to ally themselves with the birds, then they'd have a new team of enforcers on Earth to carry out their wishes. For instance, if someone makes a vow to Zeus, then breaks it, then Zeus could send a raven to tear out the blasphemer's eyeball. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal to Heracles, but Poseidon isn't so sure that's really worth Zeus giving up his scepter and his sovereignty. Lucky for the Athenians, though, that third god, Tribalus, is more afraid of Heracles than he is of Poseidon, so when it comes down to a vote, Poseidon is outnumbered, and the Olympians are forced to accept Pistheteris' terms. When the play ends, Pistheteris takes his rightful place on his brand new throne, while Zeus has no choice but to hand over his kingly power. Sure, the birds technically serve the Olympians, but what could the Olympians actually do in their weakened state if the birds decided to cut them off from their sacrifices again? Zeus was no fool. He knew what this deal really meant for he and his fellow gods, but for now, he had no choice but to accept it 
bide his time and plan to strike back when the moment was right. Meanwhile, Piss the Terrace, his fellow birds, and his loyal subjects march off singing a song of victory. And that is how Aristophanes the Birds ends. Can you believe it? Zeus's reign survived a coup staged by all of his fellow gods and a Brobding Nagian beast ripping out his sinews, but was ended by two mortals and a bunch of birds. Like I said, it's not technically canon, but that doesn't mean it's not an important story. Not only is it so entertaining that people are still performing the play to this day, but experts are still trying to find meaning in it. Some think it was Aristophanes' way of commenting on Athens' overambitious expedition into Sicily. Others say it was a parody on individuals who believed that achieving a utopia was still possible. And there's even some who think it was just escapist entertainment. I would love to hear what you think, though, about the birds and the other two myths we discussed. Which was your favorite and why? And for a bonus question, if you could put another god in charge of the Greek pantheon, who would you choose? Let me know in a comment down below. Then make sure you sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the gods, or I guess I should say sacrifice them to the birds, to get more messed up mythology and folklore content sent to your sub box every single weekday. And if you want to be one of the first to get the super hot shut up Derek tea or some of our other merch that I'll be dropping in the next week, go to meremortals.store and sign up for our mailing list. In all seriousness, this is my favorite merch drop yet, so whether you sign up or not, I can't wait for you to see the lineup. I'll be speaking with you again next week when I dive into the messed up origins of changelings. No, that's not a joke, so get hyped. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.